Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second and final College of Fine Arts Town Hall for the fall 2021 semester. My name is Julie Johnson. I'm the Director of Student Success Initiatives for the college, and I would like to welcome our guests for this afternoon's presentation. First, doc, uh, Dr. Steve Kapl Stephen Kaplan, who will be presenting for the second half of our presentation today, and Ms. Stacy Shapin, the director of our college's advising center, who will be presenting on our registration for the spring 2022 semester. Um, I'd also like to introduce the rest of our guests this afternoon. On our technical side of the house, we have Dr. Ashley Stone, who will be handling our questions and our Q&A when we get there. Also, we have Dr. Heather Addison, the chair of our uh, Department of Film, and Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Kimberly James from Music, who has also joined us this afternoon. So, with further ado, we will get started with Stacy Shapin. Stacy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Hi, everybody. I'm Stacy Shapin. I am the director of advising for the College of Fine Arts. Um, and as you hopefully know, um, enrollment for spring is upon us. So my role here today is to just make sure you get um, tips and information to help make enrollment for spring as easy as possible. I will try and provide any information I can. And if you have other questions, you can reach out to us and your specific advisor via email or um, during a drop in appointment or something like that uh, to help get all of your questions answered. Um, right now, I am putting in the chat um, the website for the Fine Arts Advising Center. That will be a primary link that you'll want to keep um, so that you're able to contact us when you need a question answered. Um, so we're just going to dive right in. Um, enrollment for spring started on November 1st. And it's based on a priority standing um, on your class status. So students who are considered seniors, which are students who have earned 90 or more credits, they get to enroll first um, and their priority window has already closed, but you can still register anytime after that priority window takes place. Um, it's just that that priority is available for you during that scheduled time. Um, juniors, students who earn 60 to 90 credits, they get to go next. And then sophomores, uh, students who have earned 30 to 60 credits. And then freshmen or new students, and they get to, um, those are students who have earned fewer than 30 credits um, at the time of enrollment. So it's freshman, I believe your priority date starts tomorrow. So we are currently in priority enrollment for sophomores. One thing I would like to clarify with everybody is the term enrollment appointment. So when you're in my UNLV and you're looking for your priority enrollment date, the way it's listed in my UNLV says enrollment appointment. This is not an appointment that is scheduled with an advisor. It is just a poorly termed phrase um, that means your date and time for a priority enrollment. The way you find that, um, Ashley, do I have the ability to share my screen? Good. If okay. you don't, let me know. Um, I do not. It is blanked out right now. Oh, now I can. Thank you. Um, so when you log in to my UNLV, you are going to log into your Rebel Student homepage, and on your tile screen, there's going to be this little bell here. Um, what you want to do is click on that bell, and then what will happen is it will pull up this pop-up window. 
If you have your pop-ups blocked, this will not work for you. So you need to make sure that you set your, your settings so that this pop-up window will show for you. You have an actions button and you have an alerts button to see your priority enrollment date as it's listed in my UNLV, it says enrollment appointment. This is when you can start registering for your spring semester, not an advising appointment. You wanna click on this alerts tab and then your enrollment appointment shows up here. This is the date and time that you can start registering for your spring classes. And that's where it's listed is in this little bell under your notifications in my UNLV. Along with that, let's see, what else do I have to tell you? Um, the other thing I want to tell you about when you are viewing, shoot, I've lost it. When you are viewing um, the class schedule, there's going to be a list of various modes of instruction. So when you're looking at a class, it's going to show you different ways that these classes are being delivered. So there's an in-person class. And what that means is, you are taking the class in person on campus in a physical classroom at UNLV. Web live means that you're taking the class remotely off campus on a computer somewhere, but it is at the scheduled time that is listed in the schedule. So when you're enrolling and you see a web live, you can count on taking the class at the time that is scheduled, but you're taking it on a computer remotely rather than sitting in a classroom. Web-based means that that class is offered on an asynchronous basis. So that means there isn't a scheduled date and time that you log in and take the class. You are only taking the class on your schedule and it is very self-directed and self-guided. So you wanna make sure that you're getting in there regularly and taking care of any assignments, due dates, all of that, because you're gonna be doing that on your own. There are also web-based classes with on and or off campus meetings. So these are generally taught asynchronously, but every once in a while, there will be a few class meetings that happen either on campus or at a remote location somewhere, and that will be listed. So occasionally you'll be meeting in a classroom. There are not very many classes that meet that way, but occasionally you'll see a class that's scheduled. And then there is a hybrid class. This is a mix of 50% non-scheduled and 50% on-campus class meetings. So it's literally about half and half. So like one day a week, you would be in a classroom the other day of the week that it would meet, you would meet on your own, on your computer somewhere. That's considered a hybrid class. So those are the different types of classes and the modes of instruction that you'll see in my UNLV. So when you're registering for classes, that's kind of what you can expect to see. This information is going to get posted. All of these how-tos that I'm sharing with you are going to be posted on our website. So you can reference them later and be able to get some of those questions answered without necessarily having to speak to somebody in person. Um, let's see, the next thing I want to talk to you about is how to set up an appointment with your advisor. Right now, we are incredibly booked with appointments for people preparing to enroll for spring. So I would recommend that you call and schedule to make your appointment now. You can plan on right now not being seen by an advisor until at least the end of the semester. Um, we, are, we are booked out that far right now. So definitely call now and get in and get an appointment um, because our advisors are filling up their time slots and that's something that's that's going to continue to get longer and longer as you go. To Stacey? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, while you're still on the subject, we had a question. Oh, I'm sorry, if, please. If you could explain why web live courses do not incur an extra student fee 
but the other categories do. Yeah, uh, yes, I can. So thank you. Yeah, the the web live is considered the same as an in person class. It's just you're meeting remotely rather than in a classroom. But the content and and the the way the class is structured and delivered is relatively the same. You will incur a fee, a, a technology fee for any courses that are web, let me think, web-based. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my, there it is. Um, so there's a there's a distance ed fee for any of the web based classes, and the reason why is that is a a class that utilizes a lot of services from distance education, and so those fees go to support those services. The web live version is like a class that meets in a classroom. It just happens to be delivered through a computer, but the but the professor is in charge of all that and that support for for all of that through web or through distance ed isn't there. And so that's why that fee is not assessed in that circumstance. Thank you. Does that help answer that question? I believe so. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. So to schedule an appointment with an advisor, my recommendation is you go through the Campus Connect website to be able to do this. This will only work for current students. So if you are changing your major, if you are an incoming student that has not taken classes before, you will have to call our advising center or email us. Um, and if someone could post that information in the chat, I would be grateful. Um, that's how you will need to schedule your first appointment with an advisor. If you're a current student, you have the ability to follow these instructions and schedule an appointment online. Um, and what you'll do again is log into your Rebel Student homepage and you'll click the resources tile that's here. Um, and then from resources, you're going to select Campus Connect. That's the platform that you can use to schedule an online appointment with your advisor. Once there, you'll click the login button, Campus Connect login, and that will take you to this screen. And you'll want to select the button that says schedule an appointment. What then will happen is we'll ask you to select academic advising for your appointment type and the type of service that you're requesting to be seen for. Generally, it's going to be course enrollment um, because that's probably what most of you need to be seen for. But if it's something else, you can select that service instead. Um, and then you can pick a date. If right now what happens is if you don't get a date that comes in here, what that likely means is that your advising appoint your advisor is booked out too far for this to capture. So you will need to contact our office to talk with somebody and we can get you set up then. If there's a date that pops up here, then you're going to click find available time. And then it will list all of the times that you can select to meet with your advisor. Um, and that will be how you can schedule an appointment. You'll then get a confirmation email once this is booked that has all of your dates and times. Um, and it will also let you, you know, know if it's a virtual appointment or an in-person advising appointment, you get to make that selection as well. So that is how you can schedule an appointment or you can email us at CFA advising at unlv.edu, or you can call us at 702-895-5390 and schedule an appointment over the phone. Thank you, Ashley. All right, so 
we're going to move on to another topic that's coming up. Um, and that is what everybody is hearing about right now, and those are the vaccines. Um, right now, my understanding is that every, basically every single person in the registrar's office has been uh, tasked with completing vaccination records and processing them. So everybody is working on them just as fast as possible. I think at last count, there were about 16,000 records that they had been working on and most of them are processed. Um, so it's, it's kind of varying from day to day, but what you can expect is if you still have a hold on your account um, that has to do with vaccines um, and you have questions about that, you're gonna see before you log in to my UNLV, an activity guide that you can complete that will allow you to sign up for classes. So what happens is you get you get this activity guide in my UNLV before you're allowed to view the schedule if you have a vaccine hold on your account. This activity guide then will walk you through the different things that you can agree to. You can register for classes that are web-based or web live only. Um, so you'll have limited access to classes if you have that vaccine hold on your account. If you've submitted immunization records and you're waiting for those to be processed, you that will then take the hold off your account. And that will then allow you to register for any class that's available once that vaccine hold is removed from your record. If you choose not to be vaccinated, you will be limited only to online web-based or web live classes. Um, this is particularly important for our students because many of the classes that you're gonna need to take for your major are not offered solely online. Um, so it is a risk that you're taking by not submitting vaccination records that you could delay your graduation if, if you're not approved for an exemption. You do have the option to submit a religious or medical exemption form, and that can be found through the registrar's self-help service online. Um, so if you intend to fill out a religious exemption or a medical exemption, you can access that form through the registrar's website, the self-help center, and that will, um, that won't lift your hold until that's approved. So you could be delayed in registering until that exemption is, or is approved. And they're not just approving everything. They may have you talk to them first to answer questions uh, before you can register for classes. So you can meet with an advisor and we can look at classes that might be available for you and options for you to take classes that are only online. But you do need to be aware that it could delay your graduation if you're not able to take some of the major courses that you need that are not offered online. Um, other questions about vaccine information can be addressed through the registrar's office. They can help with any of the exemption processing, the immunization processing, um, anything that you've got questions about around the vaccines, they can help answer for you. I recommend um, that you take advantage of our advisors drop in appointments um, and those times. Right now, um, if you're not able to get an appointment relatively soon, within a couple of weeks, you can also use drop in advising to meet with an advisor. Um, our drop in hours vary by major. And so you'll want to visit our website to 
make sure that you've got the hours for your major that are available to meet with an advisor. Um, so that you're aware, our advisors, if you don't know who your advisor is, we advise by major. And so if you are a graphic design major or a dance major, your advisor is Christy Berthelot, graphic design and dance. Um, if you are music or theater, your advisor is Rochelle Walker. If you are film art, studio art, or art history, your advisor is Jack Kelly. Uh, if you are architecture, your advisor is Leanne Carr. And if you are new to UNLV as a first time student, so you've never transferred, you've never taken classes anywhere else, this is your first semester um, at UNLV, or any major, your advisor is Ryan Ziegler. So when you're looking at our website, if you're wanting contact information, if you're wanting to know your hours, you're gonna need to know who your advisor is and you're gonna need to make sure that you're looking at the drop-in hours for the appropriate major. So you will, to find our drop-in hours, you can click on the link that says schedule an appointment and those drop-in hours are available there. We see students on a first come first serve basis. Um, please plan to wait because it's very busy right now but we will get to you in the order that you log in or that you come to the advising center. Okay. Um, one other thing I want to address for our, for our new freshmen that just started this fall, um, there is a new requirement from the Board of Regents that says that every student is required to take math and or English until you have completed those requirements for your specific major. So this year we had a new set of math and English requirements that if you had not tested into the level of English or math that you needed, you also took a co-requisite supplemental learning course that accompanied those classes. Because of the change, some of our students took only math this semester, some of our students took only English this semester because of the number of credits that were involved. So what has happened is Ryan Ziegler has assigned everybody who still needs math or English for their first year into a required math or English class. So our freshman students may have some classes on their schedules for spring already before you enroll in classes. These cannot be dropped. They can be swapped and moved around. And you can, absolutely Kimberly thinks, don't be afraid of your gen eds. Um, that's what we're here for. And they're, they're as awesome as the major classes that you take. Your math and English are on your schedule. You can't drop them without permission from your advisor. So if you have some concerns about those classes, I want you to talk to Ryan and let him know what those things are and we can work with you on them. Um, as you're creating the rest of your schedule for spring, know that those classes can be swapped and moved around to fit in your schedule, um, but they can't be dropped without permission. So that's a requirement from the Board of Regents and you'll see those on your schedule. We wanna make sure you know what those are and that you also have other classes that you're gonna to need to add to that schedule. So just be aware that it's not your entire schedule, it's just the required courses that you need for spring. And again, if you have questions about that, you can talk to Ryan or you can uh, reach out to the advisor for the major that you're in and someone can help answer those questions for you. The last thing I want to talk about um, briefly is a 
uh, a little presentation on some email tips. So when you are emailing an advisor, um, in order to make sure that you're getting the quickest response that you can, um, I just want to present this little tips and tricks for emails and how to go about getting those answered as quickly as possible. So when you email an advisor right now, it's super busy. Um, advisors right now on average receive anywhere between 50 and 100 emails every day. Um, and it's really busy right now. So as they're receiving those emails, they're also meeting with students. Um, most advisors are booked from 8.30 to 4 every day meeting with students. And so when they're meeting with students, they're not replying to emails. So essentially, we need to make sure that you understand that if you haven't heard from somebody within an hour, don't email again. It's, it's not that we're ignoring you. It's that we can't get to those emails right now. Um, it's going to take time to reply. So to get your questions solved as quickly as possible, please try and follow any of these tips as we can. Um, when you send an email, please explain your concern or issue with clear details, because if your advisor doesn't understand what it is that you're asking, they're going to have to reply back to you and it can delay your resolution. So if you can be as clear as possible in your first email, that's really going to help you. Um, if you're asking about classes, make sure that you include course numbers and sections. Um, when you're referencing courses rather than, um, okay, so I'm, I have a question about my voice lessons, or I have a question about the class that Keenan is teaching next semester. Well, he's teaching a lot of them. So the more you can do to help reduce the time that your advisor has to research your question, the faster you're going to get a resolution on it. So be clear and detailed in your email. Make sure you identify yourself. Make sure your full name and your student ID number are in your email. You would be amazed how many times we get an email from somebody that says, hey, I have a quick question about whatever. You don't sign it and there's no way to identify who you are from the email address that it came in on and we don't know who you are. So that's going to delay you as well. Also, if you wish to be called by phone, make sure you put in contact phone information so that we are able to get back to you. Please send messages from your rebel mail um, that includes your name and ID number and make sure you check your rebel mail every day because that's the email we have to reply to. Legally, that's what we have to do. Um, if your advisor has more questions, they're going to reply to your email at that rebel mail address and you want to be able to reply quickly to avoid further delays. Please give your advisor at least three business days before resending an email. Like I mentioned before, if you haven't heard from them in an hour, don't send another email. Just please wait. It's taking a while to just reply to emails. Um, also, please resist the impulse to email multiple people in hopes of getting a quicker answer. I know this is tempting to do um, because you might get a response from somebody else quicker but the more people you involve that are less familiar with your situation, you're going to create more confusion and you might get inaccurate information. Um, so please reach out to your advisor first and wait for them to reply. If you have not had a response after five business days, please reach out to me as the director or our general email and we will follow up on what's happening with that for you. Um, I, I don't want you to feel like you aren't getting a reply ever, um, but our advisors do need a little time to respond. If you don't get a response within a business week, five days, I want you to reach out to me and let me know and I will follow up and we'll make sure that we get your question addressed. If you can at, at all times be concise. Um, please try and ask all your questions in one email. Um, Email doesn't function like chat, so it's not a back and forth thing. 
and multiple emails are going to backlog your advisor and it makes it more difficult to manage our replies. So if you can get all your questions in one email, that's, that's going to help you a lot. However, of course, if you don't understand something that gets sent to you and you have another question or the answer brings up a question you didn't think of uh, ahead of time, please, please reply back. Um, but just be aware that if you can be as concise as possible, you'll get quicker resolution to your email questions. And please be patient. Um, please give us a chance to get to you. All of you are important to us and we want to make sure that we're getting to everybody. Um, we want to help you, but right now there's just too many of you for the few of us that there are. Um, if you are experiencing a time sensitive situation that regards your personal safety, your security, your finances, your health, please include the word urgent in your subject line. We don't want you just hanging out waiting if there is some emergency situation that you need to deal with right away. Um, we will get back to you the same day. If you don't hear from somebody the same day in a situation like that, I want you to email me directly and I will address your situation. Um, we wanna make sure that if you're having some personal issues, we get those addressed for you immediately. So please make sure that you let us know if there's an urgent situation we need to help you with. Um, do yourself a favor, don't email your advisor asking to schedule an appointment because by the time we get to you, probably three days will have passed and you still won't have an appointment. So if you wanna schedule an appointment, your best and quickest way is to use the online portal that I showed earlier. If you're not able to do that, schedule your appointment by phone by reaching out to our front desk or utilizing our, um, our generic email, our CFA advising at unlv.edu. Um, or you can utilize our drop-in hours. Um, they're posted online and we see people virtually and we also have options to see people in person at the advising center. These are our contacts um, and our contact information. So those are your advisor's direct phone numbers. Uh, but again, be aware that they're meeting with students, so they can't answer the phone in those appointments and you're probably gonna need to leave a message. Please make sure if you leave a message that you leave a contact phone number so we can call you back. Um, if you call to schedule an appointment and you get the message uh, on the, on the answer machine. Um, that means our students are, sorry, our front desk workers are talking to other students. If you leave a message, please leave us contact information to call you back and then please answer the call. Because otherwise what we do is we play phone tag and we call you back and then you call us again and then it's frustrating and then we hear, well, I called three or four times and nobody answers the phone. When we call you back, we need to be able to talk to you. So please make sure you answer and then we can set up an appointment for you. Um, or reach out via our email and we will set up an appointment for you and get back to you and let you know if you can um, make that appointment or not. That is all I have. Um, does anyone here in the room have any questions I can answer? I know I just went through a whole bunch of stuff. Stacy, do yes. you have any recommendations for students who might not be able to get an appointment for you with you all, uh, but their date has come up? What should they do about registering for classes if they might not be able to meet with you all for a couple of weeks? Thank you. Should they go ahead and register for classes or should they wait? Absolutely. No. Um, if you know which classes you'd like to register for or you think you know, um, you can log into my UNLV and there is what's called a degree audit in my UNLV. And it will show you all the classes that you need to take for your degree. You can register for classes based on those requirements 
or use your degree sheet that you have um, to make your best guess. Get into classes and schedule an appointment with your advisor. That way then you can meet with them later and double check and see, are these the classes I need? Do I need to change anything? But I would recommend going ahead and, and doing your best with the information that's out there, either through the catalog or a degree sheet or that degree audit in my UNLV. And then your advisor can check and, and make sure that those classes are, are accurate for what you need for the next semester or if they have um, recommendations for changes later on when you have your appointment. Or you can try and get in during drop-in hours and see somebody earlier. Um, and they can verify that. Or a third option is you can email your advisor and ask for some course recommendations. They can send you a list of classes via email, get registered for classes, and then you can meet with an advisor later when you have an appointment. Thank you. Thank That's, you. That's an excellent question. Uh, there is one, actually, there are two more things I wanted to chat about really quickly before I turn over the, the floor. One is um, SU grading. This semester, students will still have an option to change their grade to an S or a U at the end of the semester. There is a change that has occurred, and that is classes that the, the threshold for the U grade has changed. So if you earn a C minus or below in a class and you change to SU grading, you will have a U grade for anything that is a C minus or lower. Um, so be aware that if you earn a C minus in a class and you change to SU, that grade is gonna to change to a U and you're gonna to have to repeat that course because you will not have earned a, a grade that will count for credit. So S grades are C or higher, U grades are C minus or lower. Um, and that option will be available after grades post for the semester. So you will not be able to change to an SU grade until after December 14th. And there will be a deadline for you to be able to do that. So stay tuned for that information. Take a look at it. Um, that information will be available later when those decisions have been made at the registrar's office. The last thing I want to talk about is students who are on the other end of the spectrum and getting ready to graduate. If spring, if you think spring is your last semester to to complete classes and you're ready to graduate in the spring, apply for graduation. Do it now, do it this semester, because what will happen is if there's something that has gone awry and you're, you haven't completed all of your requirements, you'll have an opportunity to change your enrollment before spring starts and make sure that you've got everything covered for spring graduation. But it's important that you register for graduation now so that we can catch that up front before the semester starts and it's too late for you to change your schedule. Spring graduation, the deadline to apply for spring graduation is March 1st. So you have until March 1st to apply, but I recommend you apply now rather than waiting until the spring semester starts in case there's a problem. A lot of these how to's are going to show up on our website. So if you need information on how to do all of these things, there will be step by step guides that will show you how to do that. And that's it, unless anyone has other questions for me at this time. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate being able to deliver this information to you. And with that, I will turn it back over because that is my 45 minutes. Thank you. Well, Stacy. thank you so much. What a great job, so much valuable and extremely important information. Thank you so much for your time. Just based on what you said, we all know just how very, very busy it is in the advising center. So thank you for taking your time out of your very busy day to provide all this information to us. And this will be available on our YouTube channel uh, in about a week. 
So if anybody asks any of uh, you who are with us today, where can we find this information? It will be on our YouTube channel in about five to seven days. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you again for your information. Um, up next, we have Dr. Stephen Kaplan, who is going to talk about uh, injury prevention for artists and performers. So, Dr. Kaplan, I'm going to turn the floor right on over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Julie. And uh, again, thanks to Stacy for her excellent presentation. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am Steve Kaplan. I've been a member of our music faculty here in the College of Fine Arts for a really long time, uh, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. That's a complete lie, but I've enjoyed most of my minutes here. Um, <laughs> at 34 years of service here at UNLV. But the past five years or so, I, I started a group that we call the Consortium for Health and Injury Prevention. And um, I'm very excited that this semester we actually opened finally a dream of mine I've had for about a decade now. Um, a clinic for health and injury prevention on campus that's um, available for our students. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today is what what all that stuff really is. Um, but before we do that, I hope you'll indulge me for just literally two minutes. Um, Ashley's got a video set to show, and this is kind of a silly video, but I just feel like people need a laugh right now. I had a student on the verge of crying earlier today in my office. It's it's a time of semester where there's a lot of stress in the air. Um, so I hope you'll get a few chuckles from this video and we're gonna talk about it afterwards. So Ashley, if you could put the video up. Okay, so that's a group called the Mozart Group, and they have all kinds of videos that are fun to watch. Um, but you can see that um, a true artist has art in their soul, 
and they're going to find any way they can to create art despite any obstacles broken arms were not going to stop those guys from making music some somehow however they could and um the message though is that there are actually a lot of musicians actors dancers who you see performing and even though they don't have things on their arms so they look like they have broken arms they're actually in a lot of pain while they're performing and because that art is in their soul they find some way to present their art to the audience and you would never know that they're in extreme agony sometimes or even mild pain different variations of it and after the performance they may be in tears they're going to see a chiropractor or a physical therapist on a regular basis um, but this is a reality there there have been many research studies a fairly recent one of just college musicians showed that at least 67 percent of college musicians experience performance related pain. That when, when I say performance related pain, I'm talking about, yeah, sure, people fall down and break their arm uh, just, you know, walking downstairs. No, these are pains related to playing a violin or playing a piano or singing for too many hours a day or something like this. Um, dancers, so the surveys of professional dancers. Um, have shown that they that as many as between 70 and 95 percent of professional dancers will incur an injury annually. Um, these really are terrible statistics and unfortunate statistics. Um, we uh, we unfortunately live in a no pain no gain kind of society culture. We hear that term no pain no gain. Uh, it, it, it's kind of part of the American spirit that we're going to just overcome all odds and we're going to work through any pain, no matter how much um, it, it confronts us. Um, and in some situations, maybe that is a helpful way to be motivated. But when it comes to making art, to making beautiful music or creating a beautiful dance performance, um, no pain, no gain really has no place <laughs> in the arts. Um, and if you're experiencing pain as an artist, you really need to take it as a sign that um, you've got to start doing something different. You probably need to retrain how you're going about doing your art because there's nothing inherent in a violin or a cello that really should cause you to have an injury. It's, it's the way you're approaching the art that over time, unfortunately, will create little aches and pains. So, um, so we realized as faculty members here in, at UNLV that this is a serious issue that affects arts all over the world at all different levels, student levels, professional levels, et cetera. So we wanted to do something about it. So like I said, about five years ago, I started this consortium of like-minded faculty members here at UNLV. And we have many wonderful people that are part of this consortium. Um, one other one right here today, Dr. Kimberly James, who's a magnificent singer and on our uh, voice faculty in the School of Music. Uh, she's also a certified vocal health first aider, um, which means that she can help people with all kinds of uh, vocal issues just to help sort out what might be the problem. So this isn't just for opera singers. This would be anybody who's using their voice on a, a long-term basis and they're getting hoarse a lot or just feeling like something's a little bit off. You have a resource here with Dr. James. So that would be our actors as well as people who are singing maybe in the School of Music. Um, but we have a, a wealth of, of really talented and experienced people that are part of this consortium. And so we've done many things um, with the consortium, and I wanted to briefly talk about that. Then I'm going to introduce somebody else who's here, uh, my friend Alan, who's actually working in this new clinic that we've put together. But first, I wanted to share a few slides. Can I do that yet? And maybe we'll get that going. So the first slide uh, just basically um, shows um, a little bit of, of of what's on the website for our consortium for health and injury provision prevention we do have a website um that's available uh, connected to the college of fine arts website and it talks about what our mission is basically just to um 
provide resources and help people understand what many of the health issues are for all kinds of performing artists. So dancers, musicians, actors, um, but there are others in the College of Fine Arts that, that have these issues as well. And um, shortly after forming the consortium, we had someone from the College of Architecture that wanted to get on board because architecture, of course, has done some really groundbreaking work in how to help people um, with different um, disabilities, et cetera, using architectural space and furnishings in different ways to help people. And they were very intrigued in the, the way we were approaching health issues as well. So anyway, this is our first slide, just showing a little bit about the mission, but mainly I want you to see that we have a website available. The website has all kinds of resources. Um, things you can download, specific things that you may find interesting or helpful. Um, but let's go to the next slide real quick, and I'll tell you about one of the first projects we did as a consortium, which was to create health and safety guidelines for the entire College of Fine Arts. So we have these health and safety procedures for the CFA, and you can see a few of them there. It goes on for it's about two or three pages. Um, the, this is also on the website, um, on our CHIP website, CHIP being the acronym for Consortium for Health and Injury Prevention. Um, and so you can find these, and it's important every once in a while for students and faculty to remind uh, themselves that these things are in place. This um, sort of, they're rather generic, but they are. Um, help us to understand how important that we create a healthy environment in our classrooms. Um, people forget about things like hearing health. Many of the things that we do, again, in, in art, in theater, um, they have certain workshops where the noise level gets really, really loud. And if it's at a uh, noise level that actually could be dangerous to your hearing health, uh, we're, we're there to provide you with uh, temporary hearing aids if you don't have those. Um, earplugs is not hearing aid, an earplug is what I mean. Um, so those should be in the classroom for you or you can request those if you don't have them. Um, and we want to do everything we can to reduce noise levels, again, in, in certain musical ensemble situations, having the spacing there or acrylic shield or anything to help people. So, um, so many of those types of things are outlined in these health and safety procedures. They're sort of guidelines for you to realize that, um, that we're here to help you um, so that um, you will understand why these things are important to, to pay attention to and how um, the steps you can take to keep yourself healthy, your hearing health healthy, as well as your physical and even mental health, um, which has to do with how we pace things, having enough breaks during rehearsals, uh, things of this nature. Um, so we want you to be able to be comfortable talking to your professors about these issues. And um, you might find it interesting to see what we have in black and white here. Um, so let's go to the next slide real quick, which again reminds you of, no, that's the wrong way. You went backwards, <laughs> go forwards. Another thing we did as a consortium was like I said, there are some resources available on our website that you might find interesting, but if you go to the UNLV Music Library, we have a dedicated bookshelf. This is showing just part of that bookshelf, but these are uh, materials that you can check out for only a week at a time, but still all of these are related to health issues of performing artists. It's not just music stuff, even though it's in the music library, that's just a convenient place to put it, but there are books here specific to dancers, actors, and really all the arts. And there's a lot of really fascinating stuff. You can see it on the bottom shelf there, managing stage fright. That happens to a lot of us, and that's a huge issue. Um, there are many mental well-being issues that we need to be concerned with, but certainly stage fright, performance anxiety is a big one that many of us um, want to know more about. And so there's some good resources there. But in addition to that, let's go to the next slide, Ashley. These, this is some specific coursework that you can take here at UNLV that addresses these health concerns. 
So in the dance area, there's Pilates course, and we do also have a wonderful faculty member in dance who is known throughout the world for her expertise in Pilates. And she's on our consortium as well, and she's a tremendous resource for us. Uh, we have dance kinesiology, and we have an upper level dance class specifically on the prevention of injuries. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, dancers, unfortunately, it, it's sort of the nature of what they do that they're very, they can be prone to injury. injury. Um, and so um, it really helps to get educated about ways to, to mitigate that. In music, we have several courses at both the undergraduate and graduate level. So we have an undergraduate vocal pedagogy course, which is more than just how do you teach singing? It's about how do you teach healthy singing and how do you understand the vocal mechanism in a way that you can that you can keep your own voice as healthy as possible. And so we have a graduate version of that same course as well. And then we have two general courses about all of these health issues for our musicians, one undergrad and one graduate. I'm teaching the graduate course this semester and in the spring you can sign up talk to your advisor and you can sign up for music 480 which is specifically for undergrads though so we do have a 580 version because we have some graduate students because of scheduling reasons they will end up taking this course as well it's a two credit course that covers things like hearing health performance anxiety and a variety of um a, a lot of information about postural issues and just a way our body is structured and the way we move our body and how you can understand that better. So you personally can develop a more healthy technique on your instrument, whatever it is, or with your voice, if you're a singer. Um, so um, these are an examples of some of the coursework that we have here at UNLV, which I would encourage any student to take. Um, but you see, it's just really in dance and music. Now we have some people in theater who also have a lot of expertise in health issues um, and are very well known for it. And, and they tend to just incorporate these issues within other classes on a more regular basis, especially in workshop situations. Um, but I do wanna to go to the next slide and talk about before we get specifically into our clinic and how we work with um, actors, singers, uh, instrumentalists, and dancers. These are some other arts areas that you might not have thought about that actually have these um, injury issues and health issues, just like musicians and dancers. So there's this thing in the film industry that's called the Foley artist. You might've seen that name in the credits at the end of a film, you wondered what it is. So the Foley artist creates the sounds that are used in movies and television. And this is a photo that beautifully illustrates it. Um, you'll see someone walking down the street in the movie and you hear their footsteps, but the footsteps often are overdubbed in order to get them to sound precisely like the director of the movie wants it to sound, to have just the right character. It needs to be recorded separately by someone who's a specialist. And you can see in this case, to get the particular sound, they've got like glass on the floor or something and the shoes are being marched over the glass in a particular way. So this Foley artist has to synchronize the sound of the footsteps with the action in the movie, but they also have to get it acoustically absolutely perfect the way the director and the sound engineer want it to be. So they're going, they're doing this over and over again, many times to record it in just the perfect way. And of course, we're always pressed for time. So they're doing this along with a million other sound effects that have to be done all over a long period of time, a long day's time. And it's really grueling work. And a lot of it involves the same type of repetitive um, stress stuff that, that musicians playing a violin go through where they're practicing the same passage on a violin over and over and over again. So we get these repetitive stress injuries of tendonitis or carpal tunnel syndrome or, or different things like this. And so um, I went to a fascinating presentation with uh, some actual Foley artists who work on major Hollywood productions and they were explaining um, just how stressful this is and how the various ways that they're prone to injuries that you may never have imagined. Um, actors, um, let's go to the next slide 
Ashley. Um, actors, of course, have the same issues as dancers because sometimes they have to dance, but they're always moving on stage and they do things like sword fights and stuff. So, so they're prone to injury in the same way dancers are. Um, they're prone to vocal injury and vocal stress like, like singers are. And again, many actors do sing, but they use their voice all the time as actors. Um, so they have issues that way that have to be addressed, but they also have other unusual issues like this one. Um, so this is from a really fun production called Beach Blanket Babylon. Um, and many of the women in this production had to wear these elaborate and very heavy headpieces. This is a hat. And it, the, each of these hats weighs between 40 and 60 pounds. And so again, I saw a presentation with a physical therapist who was working with these women in this show because they were they're doing the show eight times a week, sometimes twice a day. They have a Saturday matinee, Sunday evening, or Saturday matinee, Saturday evening performance, then Sunday matinee the next day. Um, and so many of them were getting upper back injuries, neck injuries. And so they were, it becomes a problem in an equity production. It becomes very expensive. The person that has to be on paid leave and somebody else had to be brought in and et cetera, et cetera. So they wanted to find a way to get uh, these people injured less. So um, this group of physical therapists actually worked with these women using laser lights attached to their heads so they could have better understand a way to um, achieve overall body balance so they get the support of their spine and their legs better to support the way their head was sitting at the top of the spine and then to be able to support the enormous weight of that hat in a way that they would not get injured. Um, so it, it, there's some really innovative, wonderful things that can be done to help us as musicians if we seek that help, and, and art, all of us as performing artists, if we seek out that help. And so this is a reason, that's the last slide, I think. Thank you, Ashley, we can close that up. Um, this is a reason I'm so excited that we finally have our own clinic for health and injury prevention here on campus at UNLV. So it's in um, our music annex building, which is HAB1. This is on Harmon. It's kind of across the street from where all our dancers, actors, and musicians are, but it's cl really close by. You just have to cross the street and find us. And um, this is, uh, we just opened it this fall officially. And um, it's in conjunction with our Department of Physical Therapy. And so I'm really excited now to introduce Alan, who is one of our physical therapists who's working in that clinic. And I want him to give us a better idea of what really goes on if you were to make an appointment um, because you are starting to feel a little bit of stress or pain somewhere and you're concerned about it, or, or maybe you've actually been injured and you're in quite a bit of pain. Um, this is a free resource that we offer for you on campus. Now, obviously, we have a wellness, a very good wellness center on campus already. Um, however, many of our students are hesitant to go to it because it's all the way on the other side of campus, which is kind of crazy, but that's a reality. So this clinic is a little bit closer. But the other thing is that we really are gearing our work exclusively on helping performing artists with your special problems. So we have physical therapists who really understand what the artist's life is. And so they can really customize the way they work with you in a slightly different way. And so that's what Alan's here to talk to us about. So first of all, Alan, I want you to give us your last name because I want to make sure I'm pronouncing it the right way. So welcome, Alan, and tell us your full Thank name. You. <laughs> uh, Alan Savannah Pretty. That's how I pronounce it, at least. It's Thai, so it's phonetic, but that's kind of the watered down version of it. That's great. Yeah, Savannah, I, Savannah Pretty. I got it Savannah right. Savannah Pretty, yes. I'd love to hear first just why you you got interested in physical therapy as a career. Um, I'm actually, I started out as an artist. My undergrad is in fine arts, uh, eventually specializing in graphic design. Um, I moved to LA and worked in the music industry and graphic design and marketing. 
uh, actually did acting. So these are my my posters I made for a little 99 cent theater I acted at in LA. So uh, I've always kind of been an artist in search of what art kind of meant to me. So I've kind of bounced around between acting, you know, the fine arts, uh, martial arts, different things like that. And it eventually led me to physical therapy when I, I realized it was kind of, I like my, my art is, well, I mean, all art is self-expression and, you know, like, I don't know, I, I really love the, the nonverbal side of self-expression. So, you know, you've heard that's like 80% of communications nonverbal. So it's easy to see when you have like a dancer or somebody a performing artist, but less so when you just think of normal people being able to express themselves. So I was drawn to physical therapy to kind of be a part of giving that self self-expression back to people or giving it to people that might not have had it to begin with. So kind of opening up that movement back to be able to open up their self-expression. So that's what led me to physical therapy after that. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's wonderful that you have a little bit of that background in, in many different types of performing arts. Because again, that just helps you to relate better to the people that you work with. Speaking of that, I didn't want to ignore your friend that's behind you too. Does, does that person have a special name that we should know? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Bones. Mr. Bones. Okay. Not not because I'm completely unimaginative, but just because every time I saw him when I first got him, the uh, White Christmas, Danny Kay, Bing Crosby, they've got a they've got a little skit in there talking about Mr. Bones and. It's I remember it a well. big, a big part of my life was that movie. So yeah, that, <laughs> that always comes up in my head. So he is Mr. Bones. That's great. Um, I just wanted you to help people in the audience, as I said, understand this experience of what coming to the clinic might be like. So let's start with the dancer. And actually we did as a clinic, we started mostly with dancers first. So what's the typical thing? type of thing that a dancer might come in for, the type of injury they might have, and how do you approach working with them? Yeah, um, well, it did start, uh, the co-director is Dr. Turner, and she was a dancer. She had a pretty good, impressive dance career before she got into physical therapy. <clears throat> so that that's kind of what drew, drew me to this project too, is I was kind of coming from an art background and I really enjoyed like just the, uh, the idea of where she came from and stuff. But so she started this, um, kind of specializing in this, uh, Alvin Ailey, um, dance screening that would kind of help the dancers with their techniques. So the basically injury prevention for dancers that, because they, they didn't have a very specialized like just healthcare, the focus for them. So she kind of started with that. And <clears throat> I think previous classes mostly did the dance screening, but we've actually only done one dance screening. We've actually been just a regular physical therapy clinic. And right now it's about half dancers, half uh, band students. So um, they email us and set an appointment and come in for an initial evaluation and kind of give us what their main problem is, what's going on, what's really holding them back and they need to work on. And we kind of go through that initial evaluation to figure out what needs to be worked on, where, where we can help them out. And then um, most of our students have been coming about once a week for kind of uh, their home exercise program and some different therapies we can give them to help out with whatever their problems are. Yeah, excellent. So um, the other thing that now that um, fortunately things have gotten a little better uh, with COVID and we hope that trend continues. Uh, so we are able to meet in person with with people. So we actually uh, received a gift to be able to open this clinic, a, a gift meaning a monetary gift that allow us, allowed us to buy the equipment. And there's quite a bit of equipment in the room that you use and get some mirrors in there and some other wonderful things. 
Um, but we wanted to open last spring, but because of COVID, we really weren't able to do that. Um, but now that things have opened up a little, uh, we can see people in person. And what I wanted to mention is that if a student wants to bring their teacher in with them, that's a possibility. And so I had a student that uh, went to the clinic and, and I, I tagged along and got to watch all work with her. And I was very impressed with the work that, that you did. Uh, Alan works with someone named Carissa, who's also excellent. And as he mentioned, Dr. Cassie Turner is overseeing things. And we're just so lucky to have her as a resource here at UNLV. She's really fantastic. Um, but what I saw is that what you're doing once you once you figure out exactly what the issue is, which takes a little time and you have a variety of simple things you have the student do to try to figure that out, um, then you often will give them little exercises that they do with you there and then you ask them to do those at home and do certain repetitions of them and things like that. Um, and so I'm just curious, are there different types of uh, things when it comes to those kinds of little exercises and stuff, different types of things that you would do with musicians versus dancers? Um, obviously, dancers are going to have like a very unique skill set. You know, their their range of motion is going to be a lot different. So when we look at them compared to somebody that doesn't dance, you know, we, we obviously have to think about how they use their bodies first and everything. So. In that respect, some things, yes, you know, we we have a phrase within normal limits of like range of motion and things like that. And then a dancer comes in, you know, their normal limits are going to be quite different than than the average person. But for the most part, um, like physical therapists are kind of like the holistic doctors, I guess. You know, we're we're anti drugs, anti surgery whenever possible. So we're trying to get. Uh, Trying to get people's bodies moving the correct way most of the time especially with dancers or you know the band students things like that it's postural you're going to be just in a position that is not optimal for movement so something can be getting pinched or you know a muscle's not moving in the right way or some muscles will be overworked because of the way you're sitting and things so in that respect it's pretty much um where we find kind of what's what's going on and what's causing the movement problems. And then we'll either have exercises that'll strengthen deficits or try to have like postural education, get you sitting, moving, walking, standing in the proper alignment, things like that. So some things are the same across the spectrum. And then, you know, when there's a lot of things that uh, band students will have or dancers will have that'll be very specialized to what they do and how they use their bodies. Right. And so I, one thing, one thing I will say is that a lot of people are coming to us and don't realize the stresses they put on their bodies. Like a lot of the dancers, I'll ask what they're <clears throat> like, if they do any off season conditioning and a lot of them, you know, just, they go and they dance. And then when they're not dancing, they just don't do anything. And I try to explain to them, you're an athlete, you know, you're, you've got a, treat your body and prepare and condition it like the other athletes. The football players have their whole off-season conditioning. And then a lot of the band students are the same way. They're, <clears throat> they'll come in and I ask like, you know, how do you warm up? And they're, oh yeah, I play my scales and things like that. Well, how do you warm your body up? You're about to sit for two hours and, you know, hold up an arm or do something that's gonna put a lot of stresses on your body. Like, so I, I think it's it's overlooked how much they're using their bodies and how much stresses are going on to their bodies. And then they wonder why they're hurting. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and Cassie Turner, who we were referring to earlier, actually did a really interesting study with our UNLV dancers on something related to that. Cause, um, they discovered that, that many of the dancers as, as great as they were in, in performance, they actually didn't perform very well on simple cardio tests. Because, like you said, they, once they stopped dancing, they just like didn't do anything, and so um, it was a when once the research was done and she realized um, this this was the case not only here at UNLV but in, in many dance programs, uh, she started educating people like you're talking about that that maybe you should have a regular cardio program so that when you get to that performance state, you know, dancers tend to 
rehearse in a more leisurely way than all of a sudden the performance is there and you've got, you know, four performances in a row on a weekend and you, you're stressed out because of it. And so all of a sudden you're in high gear. But if you had been doing a more regular cardio training for many weeks before that, it would be easier to manage once you get to that performance situation. So I know she's been working a lot on, on making that just part of the culture more with UNLV dancers because of the research she specifically did. And we hope to do more research along those lines with all of our students here at UNLV in the future, but one thing at a time. Um, so we've talked really just about those band students and um, the dancers, but I wanna remind people we're open to any of our performing arts students coming to this clinic, uh, but especially our theater students as well. We'd like to see more of them, and I know they need the help uh, because I know lots of actors, and I know how many of them are seeing chiropractors on a regular basis and stuff like that. But anyway, and um, a lot of the students we're seeing right now, it's not that they've hurt themselves dancing or you know they've got tendonitis from playing their instrument or anything. We're seeing somebody for a TMJ disorder you know, just back pain, shoulder pains, different things like that, that, you know, it's it's not just for, you know, we're saying band students, dancers that are maybe putting themselves at higher risk. This is for the whole fine arts department. This is, you know, it, especially for um, underinsured, uninsured students that, you know, otherwise wouldn't be able to see specialized healthcare. So, you know, it's, it is for everybody that people people shouldn't be in pain. Pain is your body telling you something is wrong, so. That's absolutely right. So if you could um, tell me, how do you preserve the student's privacy? Are, are they gonna feel comfortable coming to you? Like sometimes they don't wanna let their teacher know that they have a problem like this or even their parents yeah. or whatever. So can you talk a, briefly about that? So we're very versed in HIPAA, but the students and the clinic are actually covered by FERPA. So we have to know just all the regulations, everything. We can't um, give any information to a parent without release, a, uh, like a release note. So we can't tell people's parents, we can't tell people's teachers, advisors, anything. Any The students that come to us, their information is protected. Do you have a question, Julie? I do, ha I do have a question. Um, I know you're working. I know you're working primarily with performance majors and you said it was open to anybody in the fine arts, but I'm curious to know um, what about um, like sculpting majors who are constantly working um, their hands or their standing working sculpting and their posture is bad or film majors who are, you know, carrying boom mics and things like that who are having problems with their backs. Um, or their arm muscles because they're not holding things like the proper way, would they be able to come and see you guys as well? Absolutely, Absolutely. and it, it's uh, not even something they did while doing art. It could be somebody's posture is bad and while they're studying for their math classes, you know, they're they're having back pains, shoulder pains, maybe migraines or something. So it's it's open to all the students in the fine arts department. Yeah, so let's end with you just describing Alan, um, what our current hours are that you can see them and how they make the appointment. That's a, yeah, so right now, this is kind of the first year we've had our space and everything, and we are full-time grad students. And then Dr. Turner, like we have to be overseen by a board certified physical therapist, except for the dance screenings. So right now we have Wednesdays from 12 to four and Fridays from eight to 12. And starting next fall with the next group, there's gonna be seven students. And I think they're gonna to try to create more hours because we, we are booked actually. We've been um, filled, we've had every appointment filled so far. So we've had a lot of, a lot of interest. So um, I know that'll probably be something that they'll try to address with the next year's class and everything. So I'll put the, right now, it, the best way to get an appointment is to email us. And then we will start, we'll figure out the best way to contact the students that way. And then there's our email address and times right there. And then if they ever have any problems, if you're trying to remember the email address or anything, you can go to the Fine Arts website and click through a few links to get through to the CFA chip 
and then our email address is on there as well as the hours and the address of the clinic and everything. Yeah, that's it exactly. So it's it's really easy process. Um, your privacy will be protected and I promise you, you'll be pleased with the results because they're doing really good work there. Um, and uh, it really isn't something people should be ashamed about. Um, no. <laughs> If you if you're starting to feel pain or injury, the, like I said, we live in this no pain, no gain culture. Um, but in the arts, that's not the way you should be thinking about things. It, if if you're starting to feel those little aches and pains, it's best just to be honest about it and address it right away. And it's the thing that I think is so amazing because I've been working with this with musicians now for about 17 years. I think I decided it was. Um, and what I found so amazing is that when people do start addressing these things that they've been kind of afraid to tell people about and they've been, they thought something was wrong with them, they aren't a good enough musician and that must be why this is happening to them, you know, thoughts like that come up. Um, but what they always come to find out once they finally do start addressing it is that understanding how these postural issues and stuff that Alan was talking about earlier, um, understanding what that means and how that relate, how you can use that to relate to your instrument in a different way, whether your instrument is your speaking voice or a physical instrument, um, it actually makes you a better performer. You actually start performing better because you're using your body in a better way. So you can sing faster, higher, and louder all of a sudden. You can do those mm -hmm. jumps with more elegance and grace and more consistency. And so, um, so that's been the exciting part of it to me is not only do you start feeling better, but you actually start becoming a better performer because of it. And so that's um, why we're going to continue on this path and, and hopefully the clinic and, and the consortium continues to grow. So that's all I have. If anyone has any quick questions, we're happy to address that. Thank you so much. It's been great being here. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much. And um, I want to wrap this up. So thank you to Dr. Stephen Kaplan and to Alan Savannah Pretty. Did I say that correctly? Okay, great. And I also want to thank uh, Stacy Shapin one more time for this and say thank you and good evening to everyone who is watching this. And this is our last town hall for this semester. So happy holidays. It's that time of year again. Happy holidays to everyone out there and good luck to everyone on their finals and we'll say good night. So we'll wrap that up and goodbye to everyone. Have a good night. So thanks everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>